Hello, I'm Julia Anguin. I'm editor in chief of The Markup, and I am so thrilled to be here at the FACT conference. I think I attended the very first one of these events when it was in a small room in uh, a basement, I think, in NYU. And um, I'm coming up on one year of publishing um, The Markup. We launched in February of 2020. And we have been writing and I think pioneering a kind of field of, of reporting and auditing algorithms. And I want to tell you about it and what I think the future of journalism hopefully should be when it comes to accountability and algorithms. So I thought I'd just walk you through a little bit about what is the markup? Um, what kind of newsroom is it? How have we built it? Why is it different? Um, the markup is a nonprofit. We cover the impact of technology on society. And we, um, unlike other newsrooms that write about technology, we really don't um, chase scoops. We, um, you know, there's a lot of lingo in journalism about, um, how you chase things and they're like breaking news and it's like a wave that you would run after the wave. Um, we, we don't see it that way. We actually think that it's better to take our limited resources and focus on the most important issues that we can tackle. And so what we do is we think about the issues of how tech impacts the world and we develop various hypotheses and then we try to figure out how to test them. We model our method on the scientific method. So um, we call it the markup method um, and it's, you know, science light maybe, <laughs> um, but it's definitely rigorous by journalism standards. Um, what we do is we uh, start with our hypothesis, something like um, our criminal risk scores biased um, against different races. Um, we would then figure out, well, what data would we need to test that hypothesis? Oftentimes that data doesn't exist. We have to collect it ourselves, um, either through public records or using automation and scraping publicly available data from the internet. Um, and we spend a lot of time what we, you know, building our own data sets. We then go through a process um, after we analyze the data that is modeled after academic peer review, but is, is different. Um, we seek outside experts who know about the field we're writing about, who are domain experts, to look at the data. And we show them all of our data and actually a written methodology and ask them to really be critical of what we've um, put together. We also usually bring our analysis to a statistician um, or a data scientist or maybe both who can check and see if we have done the analysis correctly. After that process, we then of course write a new story that accompanies um, our findings as well. So our stories have two parts. There's what we call the show our work part, which is a really detailed kind of academic, very long and um, and footnoted paper that is explaining what we've done. And then a more newsy um, article for the general public that tries to put our findings in a context that the average person might understand. And we, um, we think this approach is a really good way to build trust with our readers. And especially in a time when, um, honestly, there's just a lot of mistrust in journalism, you know, not necessarily fairly, but we are working extra hard to build trust with our readers. We also um, try to build trust with our readers by making a privacy promise to them. We don't um, track anything about people who come to our site. We don't have any cookies that load from third parties. We um, have to, we don't really run any analytics. We don't run Google Analytics. We don't really know anything about our readers <laughs> except what they choose to share with us like through email or social media um, or by donating. Um, we have had to spend a lot of money actually to build, um, to meet this privacy promise. Almost every tool that a normal website uses is actually usually embedded with trackers. So we've had to build our own video embed system, our own Twitter embed, our own event RSVP system. We're building our own analytics at the moment. Um, it's It's been expensive, but it is part of our 
commitment to our readers. And it's also part of what we cover, right? We cover the market of data exploitation, right? Which is a lot of what the impact of tech on society has been, which is the rise of this data exploitation market. And we don't want to also be participating in that market while we are covering it. Um, so we also go against the grain on one, another thing that is um, common in, in, in newsrooms, but I do think erodes trust with, with readers, which is anonymous sources. Um, we do use anonymous sources if there's um, somebody, a whistleblower um, or somebody like that who comes forward and, you know, it really fears retaliation, but has some information that's in the public interest. We will provide anonymity. But what we don't do is we don't participate in the game that is pretty common in Silicon Valley where tech company spokespeople um, to say, say they won't speak unless they're on background. And we don't think that somebody who's literally paid to be a spokesperson for a corporation deserves the cloak of anonymity. So much of our interactions with the companies that we cover are, are very different than their interactions with other reporters who agree to go on background. We don't. We just give them um, our findings and we send them our data and we send them our entire methodology and we say, I hope you, you'd, I'd like to know if we've got anything wrong. And we really do mean it. We want to know if we've gotten something wrong. And so we want to engage with them on the substance, but we want them to be accountable for, for what they say to us. Um, and we do all of this with um, a newsroom that is infused with technological expertise. Um, I believe that journalists, you know, we're outgunned, we're outspent. Um, drastically by the institutions that we cover. Um, I think there may be the latest stat is there's eight PR people for every one journalist in America. And, um, and so we have to use every tool in our arsenal. And I think that technology is a great tool for reporters. So we have a newsroom that is over invested in engineers. So we have five engineers and eight reporters. And honestly, I would like this ratio to be one to one. Um, but we have basically want to, to treat our engineers like journalists. They work on investigations. They report to the same investigative editor. They are journalists. They just have different skill set. They try to find stories through using automation and computational prowess. And our reporters are more skilled at getting human sources and filing public record requests. But all of those things together add up to what I think is like a super powered investigative team. Most of our big investigations are teams. So there's one data journalist and one more traditional journalist working together. Some of our projects actually involve multiple engineers, multiple reporters. Um, but I think that pairing these two together and treating them all like equals is one of the reasons that we've been able to do such ambitious projects in our first year. Um, and, you know, we have a real commitment to um, releasing all of the data that we collect. We put it out on GitHub. We have um, data dictionaries. We have readmes. We want people to really be able to replicate our findings and also use it for their own research. Just um, because we found something newsworthy in a data set doesn't mean that there aren't other things to be learned from it. And we've already found that we have quite a few Google Scholar citations and that we, um, and, and we want that. We want to contribute to the debate. I personally think that the way change gets made is um, is through data, honestly. I mean, as much as we want to decry our political landscape and there's lots to complain about, one thing that is worth um, praising is that um, data can help sway a debate. And so when we provide new data sets out there that show something that wasn't known before, I do think we have the ability to um, help that conversation be more informed and help um, policymakers make better policy. And that that's our goal. We're, we're a public um, service, right? We, we thrive, live on donations and we tell our donors that we are here to contribute new facts and um, new data to the public in order to better our civic discourse. So, you know, in our first year, we just wrapped up, um, I just looked at sort of what was our, um, what did we cover? And it's an interesting um, chart. Uh, I think that the thing that I'm probably most proud about is the fact that auditing algorithms is a really big chunk 
of our stories because this chart is really um, each story counts as one data point. And so um, an auditing algorithm story is usually in, you know, some sort of nine month behemoth. <laughs> and so those stories, although are there 14% are actually um, like gigantic projects. Um, and, you know, similarly, our tools, which I'll talk about are a very small amount of our output in terms of you know, web pages, but they are a huge part of what we want to offer to the world. And so I'm going to talk about those as well. Um, yes, this chart does not add up to 100% because some stories are in both categories. And in case you don't know what it is, FANG is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. So just the typical tech coverage, which we do a decent amount about. But I do want us to always be looking at things that people don't really think of as tech. And so a lot of the algorithms that we'll, that I'll talk about are not necessarily, some are very, very techy and some are things you wouldn't have thought of. Um, and so with that, I wanna talk about our approach to auditing algorithms. Um, as many of you may know, I, um, I think I'm probably well, best known as a journalist for the story that I did at ProPublica auditing the algorithms used in a criminal risk assessment software tool called Compass. And that story machine bias, I believe was one of the first things that really, you know, helped kick off the fact community, or at least that's what I like to tell myself. Um, and I, I think for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, what we did was we learned that there was, um, you know, software being used across the country for criminal risk assessment. And we FOIA'd the data from, from Broward County, Florida. And we received 18,000 scores of people who were given risk assessments at the time of arrest. And when we got that data, we, you know, threw it in a bar chart and we saw that immediately there was something different about the scores between black defendants and white defendants. As you can see, the black defendant scores are pretty evenly distributed one through 10, 10 being the highest risk of committing a future crime. That's what this score pur purports to predict, which is will you be arrested in the next two years um, for, a, for a crime? And the idea is that the judge would then take that into account when considering pretrial release essentially it's an idea of how risky are you and of course what you see here is that white defendants disproportionately were getting very low risk scores which was surprising um but the problem was the scores alone don't tell you is this fair or not right maybe all these white defendants were mother Teresa, and they just were picked up for littering and they were never gonna be arrested again so what we did was the hard work after this of joining this data with the future outcomes of what happened to those um, defendants in the next two years, right? Did they go on to be arrested as those scores predicted or, or were they not? And it was a really complicated join because um, the, you know, we only had the name and date of birth to go on to join these two sets. And there was a lot of um, messy stuff. And also not everybody had been out you know, of um, in f free from incarceration for the two years that were needed to determine if they were going to have a chance to recidivate. So once we um, narrowed that data set down from the original 18,000, we got about 8,000 scores and we analyzed those several different ways. But the way that I think was the most useful was the truth tables where we looked at the false positive rates and the false negative rates. And what you see is that the false positive rates are you know, much higher for black defendants than for white defendants. And the false negative rates are much higher for white defendants than black defendants. And what that means in, in regular language is that you know, black defendants were much more likely to be rated incorrectly as likely to be a future criminal. And white defendants were much more likely to be rated incorrectly as less likely to be a future criminal. And so, it just was a very stark disparity. And what I learned from that was that the year, <laughs> the year of effort, the four that four people spent um, obtaining this data, cleaning this data, joining these data, running the regressions, getting the methodology reviewed, bringing it to the company for their own comment, um, 
and um, writing and then finding actual stories of people who were scored by the system to tell in a narrative was worth it, right? The, the, it was a, an enormous amount of work. It was not the kind of work that um, newsrooms typically do. And um, it made me feel like I wanted to do more of that. And honestly, that's sort of what led me to found the markup. Um, and so I want to talk through some of the algorithmic accountability work we've done at the markup um, and the lessons I've learned from that. You know, one of the ones that I think I'm most proud of is our, our Google search results um, analysis. As anyone who knows who's used Google, uh, many of the top results on a search page these days are helpful boxes, right, that are like... Uh, provided often by Google. And so um, the we wanted to know, well, how much of that page are they really taking up for themselves? So what we did was we developed um, a method to analyze programmatically Google search results. And our data scientist, Leon Yin, came up with this method based on um, modeling it after um, a biological method of staining that people do in cells to figure out what parts of, of the cell. Um, so what we did was we stained 15,000 Google search pages with different categories, where they ads, Google products, Google answers, AMP, which is their sort of Google accelerated um, mobile loading system, and then non-Google. And once we did that analysis, we saw that you know Google results were taking up a very large portion of the front page. 41%. And um, that was even higher if you thought of, if you looked at the first page on mobile, which was about 63% of it. And we, you know, when you saw where the Google, non Google results were, you can see that they're lumped, that the gray ones are lumped into the middle and, and bottom of the pages. And our analysis has been used in the House antitrust report against Google have been cited in the various um, antitrust cases that have been brought against Google this year. And I think that they have really contributed to the debate because everyone sort of vaguely knew that Google had put a lot of its own stuff at the top, but there was no actual data around it. And that's what we have provided. Another story that we did, another way that to test an algorithm is, um, is a little grungier, honestly. Um, we wanted to see what emails Gmail puts into the promotions tab in your inbox. So uh, the promotions tab is where they sort of arbitrarily decide that some emails are just things you don't want to see, even if you signed up for them. So what we did was we signed up for almost all the political presidential candidates um, and early on in the in the race and 2020, and um, we um, saw which one of their emails went into promotions. And we saw that there were some people like Pete Buttigieg, whose emails pretty much always went to the primary inbox, and some people like Bernie Sanders, whose emails almost always went into promotions. And it was really hard to know um, how Google had made these choices. And so it was another way for us to analyze um, what the algorithm was doing, right? Because these algorithms are very hard to, to, to monitor. And so one way to do it is sort of like just we set up a box and tried to get emails. Interestingly, Trump's office never sent us any emails. They must have realized we weren't legit or something like that. Um, anyways, um, and, you know, we showed, um, we talked to um, several organizations about how this had affected their fundraising, and they felt like there was a real moment in time that they could identify where the their emails were moved to the promotion box, and they all lost quite a bit of open rates at that time and, honestly, revenue. And so we were able to show in our story that this was something that was really hurting nonprofits. Um, another algorithm that we looked at, we looked at it in a whole different way, and it's not something you would necessarily think of as big tech, but, you know, the big insurance companies are desperately trying to find ways to use algorithms to figure out how to price risk. Um, algorithms are so tempting that way in their ability to predict, 
predict the future or their supposed ability to predict the future. Um, and so we actually got um, looked at an algorithm that Allstate had been quietly rolling out and is currently still using across the country that actually just prices uh, insurance um, based on whether you're likely to shop around. So they've come up with some sort of metric about how you, they think you are likely to shop around. And if you're not, they're going to jack up your rates. So if you're if you're lazy and you don't call, they're going to give you a much higher price increase. And for this analysis, we actually did, you know, um, a decision tree because it was seem it was the there were a lot of ways to look at these numbers, but we ended up um, using this model to show that there was this cutoff at $1,900, where if you currently paid a lot, basically, they it seems as though they decided that if you currently paid a lot, you probably weren't paying that much attention. So you might as well just jack up the price even more. <laughs> um, you could see it in the in the data here about how big the price increases were. There's just a stark cut off there in terms of where the large increases start, which is where people who are paying $1,900 or more. Um, and, you know, this has actually is still being there's been a lawsuit in Texas on this. And um, just uh, recently, the state of Michigan started asking Allstate questions about this model because Allstate has not really released this algorithm to the regulators. I mean, car insurance is a very regulated industry, but they have to put in the actual price you pay, but they don't have to, have to reveal always the exact calculations. Um, and in this case, Allstate has been arguing in almost every state that this algorithm is a trade secret. And so our analysis um, was one of the first ways that regulators had a chance to see it because we got a hold of a filing that they had made when some regulators challenged them. They actually provided the prices for all their um, uh, drivers in one state in Maryland. And so that was how we were able to analyze in this algorithm. Other times when we do um, an algorithmic analysis, we um, we just um, go and try to buy, you know, disgusting ads. <laughs> so um, we, um, as some of you may know, Sophia Noble wrote a book about um, how Google search was discriminatory, discriminating against black girls and that the results were, um, all filled with porn when she would Google for black girls. And after she wrote about that, Google did clean up their search results. But what we found was that years later, they hadn't cleaned it up in um, their ad buying portal. And so it wasn't just black girls, but basically Asian girls, any sort of ethnicity um, would return all sorts of um, suggested keywords that you could buy related to porn. And for white girls and for white boys, there were no such suggestions. And so after we published this, Google fixed it. Um, and, um, but it just shows that there's a lot of different ways to test an algorithm. And sometimes we just have to go in and actually um, buy ads. Um, sometimes though, we really can't do that much automated. So when we learned that there was an algorithmic software system out there that was um, tenants were the landlords were using to screen tenants. So they would basically, you would apply to rent an apartment. They put your name into some sort of background check company and get an automatic report about you're risky or you're not risky. Some of these would just have a thumbs up, thumbs down report. And um, we found that they were um, really shoddy. You know, there's a million people. Um, uh, with the last name Martinez, for instance, and they all uh, oftentimes somebody would be denied housing because there was another person with similar name that was flagged in these reports. What we found was we weren't able to really collect any public data on it because these are all individual landlords. Um, so what we did was we scoured all of the legal dockets for lawsuits filed by people who had been wronged by this and we found a lot of them and we released them um on github and really hoped that reporters in these local areas would write about them and in fact some have um, picked up these stories but we wrote a story with the new york times about how 
these tenant screening companies were using shoddy practices that would not pass muster in the credit screening industry, which holds itself to higher, still self-regulatory standards, but higher standards, meaning you have to have a name and date of birth match. Here, they often do wildcard searches. So for instance, like Rhonda Adams, they might just search R Adams or RH Adams. And so lots of these searches would call up lots of other people. And so we found some really shoddy practices in this industry at a time when, you know, um, more and more people are renting and there's not a lot of recourse once you're turned down. You often can't even find out which um, screening company was your landlord was using and it's often too late to dispute the facts. Um, another thing that we do uh, to investigate algorithms is we actually just build tools ourselves. So um, we built something called Blacklight, which I call a creepy meat thermometer, a meat thermometer of creepiness on the internet. <laughs> um, essentially, it's a tool that you can use. You plug a URL like goop.com into our tool and it pulls up an immediate um, real time scan of what privacy violations are happening on that site. And the thing that's um, crazy about it is it's an instant analysis. So when we type in um, a URL into this, it actually spins up a couple browsers in the cloud and visits that site at that moment and runs several privacy tests at that time. And so it's a really unique tool because a lot of the ways that you might assess privacy on the internet right now are based on lists. You put on um, a browser extension, it tells you what kind of cookies are on a website, and it's based on a list of known trackers, but it's not assessing their behavior at that moment. What we found was we could identify at the moment that it's happening, companies that were recording your keystrokes, fingerprinting you, um, how many cookies they're setting, um, companies that were even um, you know, monitoring how your mouse movements were and how you, your scroll on the page was and recording those in what they call session recording, sending those to third parties. Um, using this tool, we were able to, we even found a bank that was sending um, passwords to a third party. They stopped after we wrote about it. But um, this tool is live. You can use it right now. It is really fun to just add it and look up any old site that you're going to go to, particularly ones your kids schools um, you know, that make them go to are often not the best, it's surprising. And so this is something we used for our own reporting, um, but it's also something that we actually just thought was so cool that we decided to release to the public. And then our uh, probably our biggest and most ambitious algorithmic assessment tool is something called Citizen Browser. Um, so what it is, is this little app um, that is something we pay panelists to install. Um, we have a national panel of more than a thousand people who we pay to install this app. And it, what they do is they log into Facebook through this app and they, um, and they never have to use it again once they log into it. And like once a day, we just collect information from their Facebook feed. What we do is we actually redact all the privacy, private information, their name, their friends' names, any photos, comments, et cetera. Um, and we can't technically even access the data until after the redaction process is done. And then we get the remaining data, which is mostly just honestly like URLs and news that's been shared, groups that are recommended, Facebook um, content that they're flagging. And what we find is that we really um, can see what choices Facebook is making about what to push to its users. Um, and what we found, for instance, was that Facebook had said that it would stop pushing partisan political groups during the election. So in October, they went to Congress, they testified and said that they were not going to have political group recommendations during the election season for the presidential election. After the January 6th riots, they again said, we continue to not recommend political groups. But actually we, um, looking at our panel data, found that they were recommending them all along. Um, and there was no way to know that if we didn't have a panel of users uh, who we could see across the board 
who was being recommended what. And, you know, honestly, what we saw most was that the political groups that were being recommended the most were right wing groups being recommended to Trump voters. And many of the groups we saw recommended were ones that actually were actively involved in planning and logistics for the January 6th riot. So um, after our story came out, Facebook then finally did turn off political group recommendations and they came out with a statement saying that it had been a technical difficulty. Um, but I think that for me, the citizen browser is such an important tool because there's no way to see these really personalized news feeds. There's no real good way for um, to the world to know if Facebook is holding up its promises. So we've invested in this sort of extremely expensive, <laughs> difficult engineering project. But um, I think it's had some really important fruits already. And so with that, I'd love to take your questions and hear you know, what questions you have about algorithmic auditing. And thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Julia. And uh, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed that presentation. And my name is Carly Kind. I'm the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute. We're a London-based research institute uh, working on the ethics of data and AI. And I am very honored today to have the opportunity to interview Julia Angren. Thank you so much for your presentation, Julia. Um, there's a lot of really interesting uh, questions coming through in the chat. And please feel free to continue to add your questions to the Q&A, which you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. We've got 30 minutes so we can really get into some crunchy conversation. I wanted to start though, Julia, just for those of you, those in the audience who don't know your background, you actually come from a tech background first and a journalism background second. Can you give us a kind of two minute history of your own career path? Because I'm sure there'll be many in the audience coming in particular from a tech background who are interested in how you've ended up here. And could you also tell, tell everyone a little more about the markup just from a logistical perspective? How did it wound up getting started and there's a question in the chat about who funds it and kind of what the governance structures are so just the, just some kind of framing information I think would be great for the sure. audience. So great to be here and thanks for having me. Um, yeah I grew up in Palo Alto and um, my parents were both in the emerging personal computer industry in the 80s so when computers um, finally became something you could put on your desk instead of actually being desk sized themselves and my parents were both early in it, in software. And so I was sort of raised in early Silicon Valley. Um, I learned to program in fifth grade. I worked my summers at Hewlett Packard. I studied math at the um, University of Chicago. They didn't allow you to major in computer science, but I took computer science classes with the idea that I would go back into the tech industry. Mm. Um, and so I kind of fell off that track and I fell off, um, because I fell in love with journalism. I worked on my college paper and I just thought it was really fun. Um, it didn't, it felt, I guess it felt like a rebellion, right? Cause my whole world was tech. And I, when I was growing up, I really thought there were two fields you could go into hardware or software. And it was really just like, that was the two choices. And I was definitely a software person, you know and we looked weirdly at the hardware people and they looked weirdly at us. But I, I, was, yeah, I was like, my youthful rebellion will be that I'll just like do a year or two of journalism after college before I go back mm. to tech. And so I started at the Contra Costa Times covering like, you know, just literally like the opening of the new Safeway or whatever. And, um, and then I went to DC and covered Congress and um, ended up at the San Francisco Chronicle in 1996 um, because they wanted a reporter who could cover tech. And suddenly I was, mar my tech background was marketable, even though I hadn't written a line of code since college, you know, and I can't, I, I don't think I could program now. My last language was Lisp, as all of you know, it's a delightful language, but it is, um, I'm not proficient, but it turns out that being tech literate was actually a real skill in journalism that was really helpful because mm -hmm. people who don't understand tech are, sometimes think of it as magic. And so a lot of journalists mm. would go to like the programmers in the newsroom and be like, open the magic box and bring me the data that shows whatever. And it's just really not like that. You know, you have to be mm. much more clear about what is your query? Where's the data that you're gonna get it? How are you gonna collect it? How are you gonna analyze it? And so that has been something that 
as a tech reporter started to be a real advantage for me in my mm. reporting. And so when I went to the Wall Street Journal and was covering tech and I wanted to write about privacy, I, I realized that if I could scrape the internet and collect sort of how many cookies were out there, and this is 2009, um, I could really do like a data project around it. And I hired an engineer, Ash Sultani, as a consultant, and we did a story. And then that approach, bringing programmers into the investigation sort of suddenly became my thing. And I started hiring programmers and stealing them from the graphics desk. And, you know, it's causing a lot of ruckus inside the journal. <laughs> um, uh, because, you know, there's so few data resources for a big newsroom. And I was kind of overusing my allotment. So eventually I went to ProPublica where they had a bigger data desk, but I was also overusing my allotment there. Um, and so ultimately I felt like I wanted to found a newsroom that had data as really the central piece and not just as a service desk in the newsroom and was integrated into the reporting. And so that was really the reason I founded the markup was to bring that concept to bear. Because as I said in my presentation, like journalists are outgunned and we need to use every weapon at our disposal. And to not use computation and automation to its fullest extent is to really tie our hands behind our back in this tech world that we're in. So um, so that's a long story story on the background of the markup, you know, the, the answer on our funding is that we got a really generous grant to get ourselves going um, from Craig Newmark, who pledged 20 million to start it. And then um, since then we've had grants from all sort of major philanthropy donors that you would think of Ford, MacArthur, and you can see them all on our, our website, um, but we are entirely donor supported. Great. And, and I think that background is really instructive because it, it, um, it, it, it explains, I think, where you're positioned in the landscape. I know that the markup over the last couple of years, there's been like this tension about, are you an activist organization or are you a, you know, are you a media outlet? And what is the spectrum between the two? And I think knowing that you come from a tech background in a way, um, I mean, it suggests that you you kind of are, are not necessarily like an ideologically driven outfit, but rather you're you're more interested in the kind of means and methods of, of doing journalism. Would that be fair to say? And, and can I also ask you a, to like explain a little more your, your markup method? I, I really like the idea that you're trying to make the scientific method real through using data and journalism. I wanted to like add in a provocation there, which is, you know, and I know that all data is political. And so does the choice of story or the choice of data set or the choice of target for your research um, kind of lend itself to some kind of activism or political choice in and of itself? And, and how do you grapple with that as an outfit? Yeah, I mean, I think all data is political is like a little bit our watchword, right? Like that's how mm. we start. And I think what um, the reason we spend so much time and energy and money collecting our own data is because if you rely like most newsrooms do on data collected by others, you're buying into their political agenda, right? If mm. you get a report from a think tank that says, blah, 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 we analyze the data. Well, they're promoting an agenda. That's why they collected it that way. I mean, the reason that the United States doesn't have a national database about police use of force is because there's no political will to create such a thing, right? Journalists mm -hmm. at the Washington Post had to create it because um, the, politically nobody wanted to know how much police uh, violence was happening in this country. And so if you think it's an activist role for journalists to collect their own data, sure, we're totally activists, but I don't, I, I see that as journalists bread and butter. We're watchdogs. Our job is to hold institutions and power accountable. And in, honestly, in today's world, the way to do that is to collect our own data, make our own choices. So mm. instead of living off of handouts and research studies collected by others who have an agenda, and in, I have to say, including academics whose work can be funded by institutions and not all of them, but you, know, you do have to look at the funding sources. And so mm. we decide what we think is the most important question, right? We wanted to know what is uh, what is happening on Facebook. What is the way to look at their algorithms? And we built this sort of really engineering-heavy project, Citizen Browser, to do it because we thought it was the most important question you could ask about Facebook. There are a lot of questions you can ask about Facebook, and many reporters are writing about you know what Mark said to Cheryl in the boardroom and this and that, and that's all legitimate reporting. But mm. we want to provide the unique angle we can provide is this sort of like, hey, we're going to do an actual audit, you know? <laughs> mm, mm, mm. 
You spoke a little about anonymity of sources. I wondered what your position is on leaked materials. Do you would like do you work with leaked materials? I mean, lots of the big revelations over the past 10 years in the privacy space have come from people like Edward Snowden or through WikiLeaks. Is that something you engage with as at the market? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, journalism is, um, you know, we, we act highfalutin, but we'll take data from anywhere and we'll take, <laughs> you know, a tip from anywhere, but you have to vet it, right? You have mm. to. Um, and I think also it's worth noting, like a particularly in 2016 with WikiLeaks leaks, you know, leaks are gamed. They are also political, right? All data is political. And so like, would we take a leak? Yeah, absolutely. We would take leaked data if Snowden came with another set. Yes, right? If we thought it was in the public interest, but we would definitely make that evaluation, right? I think it's just really important to understand just the way I would try to vet an academic study in its sources, you have to understand the leakers motivations and whether those are things that you can, can be comfortable with because you particularly with leaked data, don't always know the full context of it. And so mm. it can provide like a misleading view into something. And so, um, so you just be cautious, but I would, I mm. mean, obviously consider it. We're journalists yeah. and look, look everywhere. <laughs> Do you use an, like an institutional review board like process when, and in particular when it comes to personal data, how do you kind of grapple with the ethical challenges of using personal data? Yeah, that's a challenge for us. So first of all, we don't participate in IRB review. And so sometimes when there's a collaboration proposed to us with academia, that's hard for us because that's pre-publication review. And that's something journalists um, really, you know, <laughs> we spend mm. a lot of time fighting for the freedom to write what we write without censorship. And so um, pre-publication review is something we don't participate in. That said, we take privacy really seriously, right? So with our citizen browser panel, we spent a lot of time and huge amounts of energy working to figure out how to protect the privacy of those panelists. You know, we pay them to participate and they have read and understood hopefully everything that we're going to collect, but like it's personal data, it's their Facebook feed. So we built mm -hmm. this redaction pipeline and we work really hard to make sure that there's literally no trace of any personal data in the data by the time we get it and analyze it. And we mm -hmm. think about that for, for all of our data collection, but we don't have a sort of an institutional review of that. Um, I do have a board of um, our board of directors is uh, there are several privacy professionals on there. And so I do seek their advice um, on, on these types of things. Mm. There's lots of questions from the audience about access to data and how you get it. Um, and and I'm, I'm wondering if you can share it a little more. You know, some people are saying like, do, do, is it a matter of asking? I think, I mean, if you take Compass, for example, like that is a field defining study, I'm sure you know, you, you kind of very humbly was like, we're in your presentation, we're saying, I don't know if you've heard about it, but I'm quite sure that it's a, you know, definitive study for almost everyone here today. How did you get that access to that data? And, and is that a kind of, you know, a chance thing? Is it replicatable? It does it require relationships with public authorities? I mean, you talked about a bit of a mixture of open source data and close, but could you, you know, go into a little more detail about that for, for the audience? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we, we filed public records requests and um, it was difficult, you know, they resisted our request. And so we had to hire a lawyer and, you know, essentially kind of threaten a lawsuit. And then we got the data. Public records laws in Florida are pretty favorable to the press. And so we chose that jurisdiction in part because we knew we would have more likelihood of success. Um, mm -hmm. But no, we don't spend a lot of time mm -hmm. asking for access, right? So we're, um, I, I think whenever, you, you know, I would take access to data, but it's the same as leaked data. It's politically motivated, right? Like mm -hmm. when Facebook makes a data set available, they've already looked and seen whether it's gonna be favorable to them or not, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not the kind of data that we're looking for. We're not looking for access. We don't ask people to give us their data. We go out and we file public records requests or we scrape or we, you know, we're, I mean, fairly adversarial in our data collection because we mm. are, are trying to find the data that we think will answer the question. Now, sometimes we find a, a data set that exists in the world that is perfect for us. And then of course we will, we'll take it, but oftentimes we have to build it ourselves. And how do you account for like the quality of the data? You know, there's been so much said in, in recent years about um, the limitations of machine learning built off the back of biased data sets or data sets which are like have massive gaps where something we've learned here in the UK around COVID was 
lots of the health related data has huge gaps when it comes to ethnicity, for example. You know, how, how at the outset of an investigation are you able to assess the quality of the data set and account for that in your research? I mean, all data is terrible, right? Like, no matter, I've never seen a data set that wasn't just horrible in some terrible yeah. way. You know, like, it's just always imperfect. And so we just spend yeah. a lot of time talking about our limitations, right? So we have right. a section in our methodologies and often in the story itself that really just addresses the limitations of our data. And, you know, I think we are mm. lucky because the standards are even a low, lower for us than academia, right? So, you know, journalists are considered the first draft of history. So we don't see ourselves as having to be complete. We see ourselves mm. as having to be really clear about what we know and what we don't know, but we're not trying to say, this is the definitive answer. I'm perfectly willing to be proved wrong, right? Like I, mm. I think that it's very likely that, you know, I have incomplete data. For instance, our Facebook data, we have 2,500 panelists who've participated so far in this panel. Mm. Facebook has 2.7 billion users, right? Like there's a, just a very, there's a limit to the claims we could make, right? But the, but it's okay. Mm. It's still better than any other data available, right? And so we just say that and we just own it. And I think for us, it's all about owning the limitations and, and knowing there will always be limitations. How, how does the structural environment of the internet limit your ability to do your job? How are you finding, for example, with Citizen Browser, the, the attempts to bring a company like Facebook to be accountable are undermined by Facebook and Google themselves. Can you give us some examples? And I suppose related to that, do you rely on social media for the dissemination of your stories? And do you find that, that Facebook or others kind of demote your own stories in dissemination of content? Yeah. You know, I don't know if they do or don't. And um, I will say we're not particularly popular on Facebook. Like our page is <laughs> not particularly popular. Our posts don't do very well. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it, who knows why? And it, I, would, I wouldn't try to accuse them of anything. We're also just small and new and we haven't spent a lot of time trying to game their algorithm. Um, so, but yeah, we are, um, I think our biggest challenge is um, we're small, we're new, we're like not that well known. And we, mm. we try to reach people, but a lot of the ways that you reach people these days is through social media. And many of those companies are targets that we write about. So, you know, we've been working to build up our newsletter platform so people can get our emails and get directly our content. And we work to build partnerships with existing news outlets. So we've write, you know, our tenant screening story was a joint publication with um, the New York Times. Our Gmail algorithm story was a joint publication with the Guardian. So we work to do partnerships with bigger outlets that have more distribution so that we can get our stories in front of a wider audience. But really candidly, it's sometimes it's hard to partner when you're publishing an 8,000 word methodology with decision trees um, because mm -hmm. other newsrooms are like, uh, I don't know what you're doing here. And I'm not really sure I want to co-publish because I don't have the like mathematical skills to vet your work. Right. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we just have to go out on our own and that's fine. Um, I think the stories rise on their own merits, but it would be nice to, um, you know, get our stuff out there more widely. Lots of, well, I don't want to generalize, but some media outlets, I'm thinking in particular of The Guardian, um, but there are others, of course, have a kind of policy arm alongside their editorial arm, which is trying to achieve changes to the policy ecosystem to allow them to, you know, achieve their editorial objectives. Is that something you envisage for the markup as well? Would you, like, are, are you going to be out there trying to change the structural conditions to enable you to do the research you want to do? No, I don't think so. Um, the, you know, the rules here on nonprofits are pretty strict on, uh, you know, we either mm. have to be advocate, advocacy or, 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 or not. And so we're not. Um, and so we see our role as really contributing the data to the debate. And we definitely, I mean, I don't believe in objectivity, right? Like we don't think it's just like, oh, everything is just, there's two sides to everything. Like when we make a declaration, like, okay, we've analyzed this and Google is promoting itself in search results. Like that is our finding, right? We are pretty, mm -hmm. we stand mm -hmm. behind it. And, um, and so we want to contribute that to the debate, but we aren't going to be active advocates in that debate. Other people can pick up the ball and, and take that. So you don't do like follow, follow up on your work. Do you, do you like try and go out there and put it on certain people's desks or do you ever work with NGOs or activist groups and like give them a heads up that a story's coming so that they can do that advocacy off the back of it? Oh yeah, I mean, we, 
we will tell everybody about our work. Like we're not, we're shameless in that regard, right? Like we just definitely want all the people who are, who need to know, to know about our work. And sometimes we give them a head if it's appropriate or sometimes just the moment it publishes, depending. But, you know, um, it just sort of stops at that moment. Like there's a, there's a line Mm -hmm. we don't cross, which is like, we don't lobby, you know? Right, right. Um, I was listening to an interview that you did with Kara Swisher a few years ago, and you you were saying that you, when you were at the Wall Street Journal, you wrote a kind of a story akin to Cambridge Analytica that just didn't get the pickup at the moment. It wasn't the right political time for people to become outraged in the, in the same way that they did. I thought that was really interesting. I wondered if you saw like a current a parallel where you feel like you're you're calling, you're blowing the whistle on a particular practice in the tech space that just isn't getting the outrage or attention it deserves? Or do you think we're in a different era now where people are just much more attuned to the power of big tech and, and more willing to kind of get upset about it? Mm, that's an interesting question. I think I would say both. Um, you know, it's really um, nice to see that this debate is now more sophisticated than it was. You know, when I first started mm-hmm. writing this series on privacy at the Wall Street Journal in 2010, it was called What They Know. And um, it was literally about sort of the surveillance economy, which the, we didn't have that word for it at the time. And mm. I think I was jeered at by uh, many people in the tech industry who are like, everybody knows this, who cares, it's just cookies, whatever. And um, <laughs> I think there's just a more in, you know, sophisticated debate. And, and it's interesting because that work, the Wall Street Journal work from 2010 was really what inspired us to do Blacklight. I was like, let's do that same study again, but for 2020, like, like mm. the, the privacy invading techniques are more sophisticated and our ability to build a, a scanner for it is actually more sophisticated. We can build a real time mm. scanner instead of just doing a one, one off census. And so it was really, sometimes I feel that journalism is really obsessed with novelty and like what's new, but sometimes it's important to just do the same story over and over again. Right. <laughs> and that's how you get impact. <laughs> That's really cool. There, there's a few questions about kind of like, uh, you know, what can people do and, and and how can they, you know, take on your your legacy, I suppose, in their own work. So I might direct some of those to you. One, one person's asking about um, investigative ju- journalism at the local level. And, you know, do you have any advice for community community journalists to conduct, or, or, or I suppose research communities as well, who are interested in conducting their own kind of forensic investigation efforts. And I guess that might apply both to, to, to media at a local level, but perhaps also research is interested in mimicking this kind of adversarial audit style. I, I wonder if you have any kind of broad, broad suggestions or yeah. advice for them. I mean, I get this question a lot. And I think the one thing that I always, what I don't want to be is per- feel, I don't want to present our work. So it's so complicated that no one else can do it. Right. Mm. And like, and so I like to encourage local reporters to say like, you know what, you don't have, obviously you're not going to do the gigantic, you know, eight engineers building citizen browser, but like you can actually go into the ad portal and see if you can buy discriminatory ads, right? Like there are, mm. there are ways to test these systems that are lower lift, or you can file um, FOIA requests, public records requests for, you know, local, um, you know, contracts with the Amazon warehouse, or, you know, there's, there's things you can mm. do that are lower lift. And so I, I do want to make it clear that like, not everyone is going to have the resources that we have. And like, we also love to partner with other newsrooms and institutions so people can always reach out and see if there's something that we could help out with. Mm. Great. And and I guess the last question we have from somebody who's asking what can individual tech workers and especially those working for big tech do for investigative journalism beyond whistleblowing? Do you have a kind of ideal relationship between tech workers and journalists in your mind? Yeah, I mean, look, um, the real truth, and I'm sure this is not the greatest thing to say, but the real truth is that journalism is just financially sinking into the (laughs) ocean. And so honestly, what journalism needs is money. (laughs) Um, And so anyone who can donate, and not just to us, but just to journalism in general, you know, I think there needs to be a more structural solution, honestly, because can't just really come from individuals, but the entire business model of journalism has been destroyed by the surveillance economy, right? Like, so when I worked at the Wall Street Journal, they sold a full page ad 
a $400,000 because that's the only way you could reach a guy who golfed and was, had a Mercedes and was a mid-level manager. Well, now you can just follow that guy around on the internet and get him on a really cheap website, um, pay a fraction of a penny for his attention. And so that has destroyed journalism, which is destroyed investigative journalism. And so there's only a few places like myself and ProPublica that have found donors willing to support us, but ultimately there needs to be a financial solution. Wow, yeah, that's such an evocative uh, story and I think a great way to end. So all those tech workers out there, go and donate to the markup and to others. Um, and otherwise, thank you so much, Julia, for making time and, and telling us more about your work. It was just really thank fascinating. You. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. Um, and thank you to all the audience for joining us. If you want to give some feedback uh, to the conference organizers, you can head over to Stream One now where there is a town hall going on. And thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy. See you later.